Hello and welcome to another Common Core Geometry lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we'll be doing Unit 2, Lesson Number 4 on Isosceles Triangles. Now Isosceles Triangles are probably triangles that you're very well aware of, okay? But they have a lot of amazingly important properties and properties that we actually can prove using things that we now know about rigid motions, alright? So, before we kind of get into the properties of isosceles triangles, let's see how they're defined. <coughs> Excuse me. So, the definition of an isosceles triangle might come as a little bit of a surprise to you. So let's take a look at it. An isosceles triangle is any triangle with at least two sides of equal length, two congruent sides, all right? Now, wh why do I take a little bit of a moment to talk about this, that term, especially the term at least? Well, it means that isosceles triangles could have two sides of equal length or three sides of equal length. Now, granted, when they have three sides of equal length, we've got what's known as an equilateral triangle, but every important property of isosceles triangles is also a property of equilateral triangles. It's kind of like eventually we're going to say that every square is a rectangle, right? Anyway, we've got a whole variety of different isosceles triangles up here from the most basic, like this one, right? Where we've got these two sides being equal lengths. Oftentimes we use small markings on the side lengths themselves to indicate that they're the same length. We could have an obtuse triangle like this that's got an obtuse angle and two sides of equal length. We can even have a right triangle, an isosceles right triangle, where the two legs have the same length. And finally, of course, down here, we've got the classic equilateral triangle. And again, technically speaking, it is also isosceles because it has to have at least two sides of equal length. Now, what we're gonna do is we're going to take the fact that isosceles triangles have two sides of equal length, at least, and we're going to figure out some very interesting properties that come from that fact. Let's jump right into that in the first exercise. All right, exercise number one, it fills up the entire first sheet of this lesson, all right, because it's a big, big exercise. And let's take a look at what this problem says. Consider the isosceles triangle ABC shown below. Now again, ABC, all right, where AB, is equal to AC. I'm going to mark it with those little dashes. In the diagram, the vertex angle BAC has been bisected by AD. I'd like to step back for a little bit and talk about this. One of um, Euclid's most sort of basic of all axioms is that every angle has a unique angle bisector. So when we're looking at triangle ABC, that isosceles triangle, I can definitively draw that angle bisector in because there is an angle bisector. All right, that's all. And remember what that angle bisector means is that these two angles are congruent to one another. Now, let's take a look at letter A. It says using tracing paper, verify that the measure of angle BAD, bad, bad angle, is the measure of angle CAD. All right, now remember if it's an angle bisector, if AD is an angle bisector, those two angles should be congruent. Why don't you use tracing paper to verify that? Are you ready? Now, for me, I just decided to make a copy of angle BAD like this. I can easily see that the two angles are equal by simply rotating this angle. Almost. and seeing that the two rays lie on top of this angle. So those two angles are congruent. Remember, angles are about rotation. They're not about distance. They're not about length. All right, I'm gonna rotate this angle back. Okay, and maybe leave it up there. Let's take a look at what letter B asks us to do. The non-vertex angles of an isosceles triangle, the non-vertex angles, of an isosceles triangle are known as the base angles with, non, with a non-equal side known as the base. What appears to be true about the base angles? Test your conjecture. 
So again, let's make sure you understand terminology. Whenever we have an isosceles triangle, and I'm going to assume it's not equilateral, and we have two sides that are congruent, the angle that's between those two sides, that's what's known as the vertex angle. All right. The other two angles, here and here, those are known as the base angles. Okay, and those are what we're talking about right now. Now, what do you think are true about angle B and angle C? What, what's going to be true about those, do you think? Well, hopefully, you said, ah, they're going to be equal or congruent, one of the two. Equal or congruent. We can easily, easily test that with this one particular diagram by using tracing paper. Again, the way that we would do it is we would take our angle like this, maybe trace it out right, with our green. Then we would want to see if that angle overlays the other base angle. In this case, I might flip my, um, my tracing paper over, but then I can see that in fact, it fits or coincides right on top of that other angle. Remember, an angle is simply a geometric object made by connecting two rays at a shared point, right? The length of the two rays does not matter, only that there's two rays connected at a single point. All right, so it appears that the base angles of an isosceles triangle are equal, that those two angles are equal. All right. Oh, well, I didn't want that to happen. I was just trying to get rid of this. Let me delete that. Okay. As well, letter C asks us, what is true about segments BD and CD? All right, so again, what's true about segment, whoops, let me go back, get, grab my pen. What's true about segments BD and CD? Why don't you go ahead and use tracing paper to take a look at those two? They are congruent as well. Or you could say, or, <laughs> get rid of the comma, they are the same length. Now, <clears throat> let's make sure this is really, really critical to understand what we just found. What we just found is if you've got an isosceles triangle and you bisect the vertex angle, that was a pretty horrible job on this isosceles triangle, right? You bisect that vertex angle, you will also bisect the base, these two being the same length. Now again, we're discovering all of this experimentally. We haven't proved any of it, all right? But understand what we've now kind of sort of observed. One thing we've observed is that the angle bisector of the vertex angle bisects the base of the isosceles triangle and the base angles, right, are the same size. They're congruent. So now what we want to do is we want to try to think about why this must be true based on rigid motions and the properties of rigid motions. So let's keep going a little bit. Exercise D. Now I've reproduced the diagram down here so that we've got it right in front of ourselves and we don't have to keep going up and down and up and down. All right, but let's take a look at what letter D asks us to do. We'd now like to use the facts that we've learned about rigid motions to justify all of the observations we've just made. Answer the following questions. Subsection I. If we reflect triangle ADC across ray AD, explain why points A and D do not change their locations. These are known as fixed points of this reflection. Make sure you understand. We've now got the same picture, isosceles triangle ABC, angle bisector, AD drawn in. And what I'm saying is if I take triangle ADC and apparently throw it down there, if I take triangle ADC and I reflect it, right, why is it that point A and points D, points A and D, don't go anywhere? They're fixed points. Why is that? 
I hope you said, because A and D lie on the line of reflection. Remember, any time we reflect <clears throat> points in a line, and those points lie on the line of reflection, they stay put. They don't go anywhere. So, you know, we took that triangle, we flipped it over AD, A and D stayed where they were. Now, more importantly though, if, let me extend the page a little bit, bring this up. All right. If we reflect triangle ADC across AD, which we did, remember this was triangle ADC, let me flip it back, right? There's triangle ADC, and then we flip it across AD. Why does point C have to fall on point B? Why does point C get mapped to point D? Now this is important, okay? You have to actually go back to something that we looked at when we looked at reflections in the last lesson. But I'd like you to see if you can think of why that point must map to point B. Take a moment. All right, let's talk about it. Now there's two things that you really have to cite to explain why C must get mapped to B. To begin with, one, angle CAD is congruent equal to angle BAD. All right, these two angles are equal. So AC falls on AB. And actually, let me call it A prime C prime. In other words, we learned that if we reflect an angle across a shared ray, the non-shared ray will always fall on that one if these two angles are congruent. So no matter whether this was an isosceles triangle or not, the fact that this angle is congruent to that angle guarantees that when I reflect angle CAD across AD, then ray AC would fall on ray AB. But there's a second piece of it. All right, because AC equals AB, right? That's where the isosceles triangle part comes in, right? And we have to bring that in somewhere. Because AC and AB are the same length, right, then C maps onto B. One of the major conclusions, one of the final conclusions that we had in our lesson on reflections was that if we had two congruent angles that shared a common ray and we reflected one angle across that shared ray, then a point on that ray would only get mapped to a point on that ray if they were the same distance away from the vertex. All right, but that's exactly what we have here. And again, you can see it experimentally. When I had that and I flipped it across that pair of congruent angles, point C landed on point B. Now here's the real kicker, finally. All right. Extend it a little bit. Sorry, keep extending the page some. Explain why we can now conclude that ADC and ADB have the same shape and size. How does this prove the observations? All right, well, this is amazingly important. It's probably the most sophisticated argument we'll make yet with rigid body motions, but reflections are rigid body motions. And by reflecting, uh, 
by reflecting triangle ADC, whoops, A, uh, ah, yeah. by reflecting triangle, I did it again, by reflecting triangle A, D, C, across ray, D, C, it mapped, funny A, it mapped onto triangle A, D, B. Again, let's make sure that we understand that. When I took ADC and I flipped it across, it mapped onto ADB. But that means triangle ADC and triangle ADB must be identical. We'll eventually just get right to the chase and we'll call them congruent, all right? But for right now, congruent, identical, are really the same thing. Those two triangles are identical. Now think about that. So if the two triangles are identical, that means all parts that are in the corresponding places on the triangle are also identical, right? If this triangle in red is congruent to this triangle in blue, yes, well then these two lengths have to be the same. They must be the same. And likewise, these two angles must be the same. And they have to be the same because as long as there's some kind of rigid body motion, that I can use to change, to map this triangle onto this triangle, and really what it means to map one triangle onto another triangle is to get all three vertices to land on top of each other, then the two triangles are identical. And then any matching portion of each triangle has to be identical. We'll eventually call that CPCTC, corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. But don't worry about that for right now, all right? The plain fact is we now know that the angle bisector of an isosceles triangle, right, the angle bisector of an isosceles triangle will also be the segment bisector of the base, and we've also proven using a rigid body motion that the base angles of the isosceles triangle have equal sizes, or are congruent. Congruent just means two geometric objects have the same measurements. All right, let's keep going. Now, one last little piece that we want to get from all of this that's exceptionally important has to do with these two angles right here. The angles that the angle bisector of BAC make with the base. So let's take a look at this problem. Exercise number two says, the diagram from exercise number one is reproduced below. Given what we learned about in exercise number three, give an explanation for why AD must be perpendicular to BC. Now this is again very, very important. We're now going to use what we learned before about the rigid body motion and the mapping of one triangle onto another to come up with the conclusion that the angle bisector of the vertex angle happens to be the perpendicular bisector, very important, the perpendicular bisector of the base. So why must that be perpendicular to the base? All right, well, let's talk about it. One thing that we can say for certain, right, let me kind of get rid of all of this just so that you can see it a little bit better, is that because the triangle there in blue, and let's flip it, left, right, is congruent to that triangle, because those two are identical, this angle, angle BDA, if you will, and this angle, angle CDA, these must be congruent. These two angles have to be the same, because they are in the same spot on two congruent triangles, on two identical triangles. Ah, but we also know that this entire angle must have a measure of 180 degrees because it's a straight angle.
And any time you take a straight angle and you divide it into two angles that are of equal measure, well, obviously, 180 degrees divided by 2, each of those angles must be 90 degrees. So this is amazing. You know, we've found some crazy conclusions about the angle bisector of the vertex angle of an isosceles triangle. One, it's got to bisect the base, and two, it's got to be perpendicular to the base of any type of isosceles triangle. Any type of isosceles triangle, this is going to be true. All right? Let's kind of take a look at that. Okay? Exercise number three. In an isosceles triangle, the angle bisector of the vertex angle, angle BAC above, that was above as in the previous problem, will always be the perpendicular bisector of the isosceles triangle, of the base of the isosceles triangle. Why does the term perpendicular bisector make sense? What two properties does it have? In other words, if those are the two congruent sides of this isosceles triangle, right, I'm claiming that this line is the perpendicular bisector of the base, all right, and all I'm asking is why, why does that piece of terminology make sense, the perpendicular bisector? Well, two reasons. First, it is perpendicular to the base. And number two, it bisects the base. angle bisector of an isosceles triangle is perpendicular to its base and slices its base in half. And that's all from the perspective of rigid body motions and really comes from the fact that isosceles triangles are what is, are known as symmetric, right? They look the same on one side of this angle bisector as they do on the other side. And in fact, I'm sure this is pretty obvious to most, if I draw that angle bisector in to an isosceles triangle, it divides the isosceles triangle into two identical right triangles. Two identical right triangles. Let's take a look at this a little bit, just briefly, on a GeoGebra widget. All right, so let, let, let's take a glance at it. Now, in this diagram, we've got an isosceles triangle with equal sides A, B, and A, C and a base of BC. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask GeoGebra to draw in the angle bisector, okay? Is it here? No, is it here? There it is, the angle bisector, okay? So I'm gonna ask it to bisect angle BAC. There it is. Now, if what we said was correct, then let me just mark a point of intersection here, then in theory, that angle bisector should also be perpendicular to the base. Now, it looks perpendicular to the base, but just to be sure of it, I'll ask GeoGebra to measure that angle, and it's 90 degrees, so it is perpendicular. And the other thing that we noted was that it should have also bisected the base. And again, it looks like it did, but let me make sure of it. And look at that. So there we go. Now, what are we seeing here? For this generic isosceles triangle, what we're seeing is drawing in that angle bisector, right? Drawing it in. It is now perpendicular to the base and bisects the base. Again, these might be properties that are rather obvious to you when you look at an isosceles triangle, but we were able to prove them by using the properties of reflections along with rigid body motions. All right, let's move on a little bit. One final problem. I cannot overstate the importance of what this problem allows us to conclude. So let's make sure that we understand what's going on. 
Let me read it to you. Exercise 4. Segment AB, shown below, has the perpendicular bisector M. All right. So in other words, I've got this segment AB. Okay, and I'm claiming that this line M does two things. It's perpendicular to AB and it cuts it in half. Perpendicular cuts it in half. A variety of points along M have been marked. So there's just, you know, a bunch of different points that are on this perpendicular bisector. Okay, erase all of this. Okay, letter A. What is true about each point on the perpendicular bisector compared to the endpoints of the line segment? Measure to confirm. Draw segments in. Do you see the isosceles triangles? All right. So here's what I'd like you to do. Take a moment with your ruler, or with a straight edge of any type, okay, and your pencil, and simply connect each one of the points along that perpendicular bisector to the end points of the line segment. Connect them to A and B. All right, take a moment to do that, and then I'll do it quickly as well. Are you ready? Let me do it, okay? I'm gonna switch over to my line tool. That'll make life a little bit easier. And I'm gonna connect that to that. Connect that to that. And also down here and down here. <clears throat> now, the other part of this problem was to measure each set of that, those. I'm not gonna do each, each one of them for you. I'd like you to do each one of them, but let's just take a look at one set. Maybe what we'll do is we'll measure AM and MB. So in other words, if I bring this over here and I measure out AM, what I'll find, let me get back to my writing tool, is that MA or AM, whichever you like, is 50, ha, let me get that out of there, is 56 millimeters. On the other hand, if I center it at B and I bring it down, I will find that MB is also 56 millimeters. Now, what I would find is if I measured each one of these things, each time I would find that any point along this line, the distance from that endpoint and the distance from that endpoint are the same. Okay? And it says, do you see the isosceles triangle? In other words, we have an isosceles triangle here with these equal sides. We have an isosceles triangle here with these equal sides. We have an isosceles triangle here with these equal sides. Okay? And in fact, what it allows us to do is fill in a very important statement down here. All right? A point will lie on the perpendicular bisector of a segment if and only if what? So what, it, what will happen if a point lies on this perpendicular bisector compared to the segment that it's bisecting? What's going to always be true? All right, now this could be a little tricky. A point will lie on the perpendicular bisector of a segment if and only if it lies, fancy word coming up, it lies equidistant, distant from the endpoints of the segment. Sorry, I ran out of room there. All right. Let's talk about this. Um, equidistant is just a fancy word for same distance. All right, equidistance, same distance. And again, make sure you understand this is critical and we'll see an immediate application of it in a moment. But it basically works like this. If and only if, it's like a two-way road, okay? What I mean by that is the following. 
If a point lies on the perpendicular bisector, then it's the same distance from one endpoint, 56 millimeters, as, whoops, <laughs> as it is from the other endpoint, 56 millimeters. We'd find the same here and here. The other piece is, if a point is equidistant from the two endpoints, then it lies on the perpendicular bisector. All right. The perpendicular bisector of any segment is basically just a collection of all the points that lie the same distance from one endpoint as they do from the other. That's it. And it's really cool. We could take any point we want on this perpendicular bisector. And if I measured how far it was from one endpoint and the other endpoint from A and B, we'd find it was the same distance. And that's really all about, it's all about the, the isosceles triangles here. Right? The isosceles triangles allow us to know that the vertex of the isosceles triangle will lie on that perpendicular bisector. Now let's see an immediate application of this. It's really kind of cool. Extend the page some. All right. Letter C. Using only a straight edge and a compass, construct the perpendicular bisector of CD shown below. Leave all construction marks. So we somehow want to construct a line that passes through, you know, that bisects this segment and is perpendicular to it. And what we know is that any point that lies equidistant from one end of the line segment, from the two ends of the line segment, will lie on that perpendicular bisector. So let's find one of those points. It's really, really easy. Watch. Join me. I'm going to take my compass and I'm going to put the pointy end at one end of this line segment. It doesn't matter which. And I'm going to extend the compass to be greater than half the length of the line segment. Can you make it the entire line segment? Absolutely. Can you even make it more than the line segment? Sure. It's just got to be more than half. So I'm just going to go a little bit more than half. And what I'm going to do, whoops, that slipped a little bit off of point D, is I'm going to draw an arc. Okay. Now, without changing the radius of my compass, I'm going to put the point at point C. And I'll explain why I'm doing all of this eventually, but just bear with me for the moment. And I'm going to draw that arc. Now, keep in mind what I just did. All the points along the, these two arcs are the same distance away from D as they are away from C, because I kept the radius the same. And in fact, I think I misspoke there a little bit. In fact, that is the one point, right? That point at the intersection of those two arcs has to be the same distance away from C and D, right? That whatever that radius distance was that it was set. And because that point is equidistant from C and D, it lies on the perpendicular bisector. All right, one more time. Because this point lies equidistant from D and C, just based on how I constructed it, it must lie on the perpendicular bisector. But we need two points to really truly define a line. So we need to find another point that is equidistant from the two endpoints. Strangely enough, we could find another point on this side if we wanted to. But traditionally, people will tend to find a point on the other side of the line segment. Remember, any line is completely and uniquely determined by two points. But let's do this. Let's come over now again. Let's put the point on C or D. We could use exactly the same radius we did before. Exactly the same radius we did before. Or we could use a different one. I'm going to actually use a slightly different one. In fact, I think I'm going to now make this, maybe, the length of the whole line segment. OK, bring it down here. I'm going to draw an arc. Nice arc. All right. Now what I'll do is I'll switch my pointy end to up here to D. Draw another arc. Get that out of there. And again, all the points along this arc are the same distance from C. All the points along this arc are the same distance away from D. And where they intersect is equidistant from D and C. That's right here. So that point must also lie on the perpendicular bisector. But now I have two points that lie on the perpendicular bisector. So if I go ahead and grab a ruler, or at least a line tool, and I connect these two, that is the perpendicular bisector. 
Now, as a little bit of a side note, right, this, this seems to take quite a bit of work. And one thing I noted was that, you know, when I make the arcs over here and the arcs over here, when I'm on a given side, I gotta keep the radius the same. These two arcs have to have the same radii, and these two arcs have to have the same radii. But, okay, I, they don't have to be the same from here to here, but they can be. So real quickly, real quick, what most people will do, I forgot I can't erase those that way, that's okay. What most people will do, come back to me, when they make this, is they'll bring this thing over like this. Let me rotate it up. Oftentimes people will use, automatically use the entire segment to do this. And they'll kind of just do something like this. Oh, I should have, should have gotten rid of that perpendicular bisector, but actually let me leave it there. That could be kind of cool. Then they'll go like this. Whoa. All right. And then they'll connect those two points. It looks a little bit like a fish right now, right? And you can probably even see that if you extended the perpendicular bisector this way, it would fall through that point. That's a completely good way to do it. You don't have to change the radius of the arc on either side of the line segment that you're perpendicularly bisecting. This is gonna be one of the primary um, constructions that we do. So when it shows up on the homework, make sure that you work on it. It's very important. And again, also try your best to make sure you understand why it works. We locate two points that we know are equidistant from the endpoints of the line segment. Because they're equidistant from the endpoints of the line segment, they have to lie on the perpendicular bisector, connect the two points, and we've bisected that line segment. And we've perpendicularly bisected it. That's not easy to say. All right, let's wrap this thing up. Now, the title of the lesson was isosceles triangles, but really what it was all about were some certain properties of isosceles triangles that we justified using rigid body motions, specifically ref a reflection across the angle bisector of the vertex angle. From all of that, we managed to figure out that the angle bisector was also the perpendicular bisector of the base, and a little bit less important for right now, we also determined that the base angles of an isosceles triangle had the same measurement, they were congruent. All right. Finally, we learned how to bisect a line segment by using the fact that any points that are equidistant, the same distance from the endpoints of the line segment, must lie on the perpendicular bisector. All right, that's gonna be absolutely crucial to many, many of the constructions that we do but those are future lessons. For now, I'd like to thank you for joining me for another Common Core Geometry lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.